took me really, really a long time mm -hmm. to discover my voice. Because yeah. I found out, oh yes, larynx must go down. Nobody told me that. You're a tenor, you have to sing very high, and it, everything is out there, mm -hmm. it's high. Mm -hmm. And you know what I mean? Oh, it's, everything is high. And this alone is the killer <laughs> for everybody, not only for tenors. Yes, I heard that also oh, before. On. He's like a donkey, stubborn like a donkey. <laughs> I heard that before. <laughs> wow, it's actually an amazing role. If really? I would be a baritone, I would die. I would kill to sing Iago. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for the invitation. It's a big pleasure. Big honor. And I have to thank the good people of the Deutsche Oper for providing this oh, outstanding yes. location. What are you doing in Berlin? Well, I am... This time of the year, especially. This time of the year. I am rehearsing Manon Lescaut mm -hmm. uh, for a uh, Vida of Name. I don't know in English how it is. Mm -hmm. It's a production that already exists. Mm -hmm. And it will open next... Thursday, the 11th. Yes. So I'm here for that, rehearsing. Mm -hmm. it's, but it's not the first time that you're here. No, no. Uh, I came the first time in 2017. Um, it was a fantastic, amazing jump in for um, André Chenier. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Alanya had, uh, was ill, and then they called me, and then I came. and. It was the beginning of a beautiful relationship with the Deutsche Oper. Yes. So you have returned many times. I returned many times for André Chenier. Also, I did uh, Turandot. And um, here I am again now for, for Manon Lescaut. Chenier is a very nice production. Right? It is a beautiful production. Beautiful production. Really, really colorful, really uh, energetic. It's really beautiful. Yes. Amazing. Yes. yes. Speaking of which, you are from Brazil. I'm from Brazil, yes, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tell me about it. Where, where exactly are you from? I am from Porto Alegre. Mm -hmm. It's the, it's the south, uh, city in the south. It's the um, capital of this, um, how you call it, Bundesland region. A region, Rio Grande do Sul. Mm -hmm. We are the gauchos, cowboys, mm -hmm. if you want, uh, from Brazil, uh, the Pampas, and um, yeah. This city is called Porto Alegre. Mm -hmm. yes. I was 18, then I, I kept singing in choirs. I, I began to sing in different choirs, more professional ones. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I was a baritone, or I thought I was a baritone. In a choir, I was singing as a baritone. I'm not surprised. Yeah? OK. <laughs> yes. But uh, later on, when I began to study um, private, I, I got to 
get private lessons, mm -hmm. uh, singing lessons mm -hmm. um, in Uruguay, in Montevideo. I, I was taking the bus from Porto Alegre to Montevideo, like for it was 12 hours or 14 hours, oh, I don't and stay there for one week, yes. uh, working with mm -hmm. uh, this bass baritone, uh, Jean-Charles Gebela, or Juan Carlos Gebela, who mm -hmm. was my first mm -hmm. teacher there. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, I don't think you're a baritone. Mm. I think you're a tenor. And I was like, no, oh, please, <laughs> no, I don't want to be a tenor. Terrible, no. Why? Why did you not I, want to become I a tenor? I didn't want, I, I loved the, the bad guys. Yeah, the bad guys, <laughs> and I was already listening to some Verdi operas, you know, and this baritones and this, wow, this voice. I thought, oh, this is so good, and you know, Rigoletto and the mm -hmm. stuff. And I thought, wow. And he said, no, no, you're a tenor. I said, oh my God. And at that time, also, I was, um, uh, we were at home, like, really consuming a lot of um, videos, opera videos, because uh, the, the, let's say the cultural operatic lyrical life in Porto Alegre was a little bit restrict. We have and we had and we have a very good orchestra mm -hmm. and uh, we had every week uh, great concerts. Sometimes we had this gala lyrica with mm -hmm. singers coming from Brazil or from other parts of South America, from Argentina, from Uruguay. Also my teacher I used to sing there. So but not we didn't have really an opera um, scene. You know, scene. Yeah, in Porto Alegre. So uh, I was watching every video from the Metropolitan, from Covent Garden and stuff like that. All these guys, Domingo, Pavarotti, Geta. Mm -hmm. So I was really consuming that. And, mm -hmm. um, and I thought um, I want to be one um, singer also. Mm -hmm. I would never think it would be so difficult, <laughs> but I wanted to be like a singer. I wanted to become a singer. What did your parents say about that? Yeah, my parents, um, they always um, gave me uh, all the support, you know. Although in the beginning they said, okay, study something else, you can make music parallel or as a hobby maybe, and then you see. Mm -hmm. Because they were concerned about work and stuff like this, of course. I tried, I studied uh, two years of uh, journalism, mm -hmm. and it didn't work. I was so into music, I said, so I, I did the abitur also for music in my city and I passed. And so I began uh, to study music in the university there in Porto Alegre. Mm -hmm. I was 21, 22, 21, 22, and um, I had the possibility to come um, to Germany to study. Um, and I did it. I went to Lübeck, um, to the Hochschule, and I began to study, yeah, there. How come, why Lübeck? Out of well, well, it was actually like that. You I could go to Berlin. No, I could go Munich, to, yes, I, exactly. Um, I, w I was completely lost in, completely lost in translation, completely like, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I, I had this idea, I would find a, master, I would find a leading figure, singer, who would lead me through life of singing opera and, you know, because I, at the time, I watched this film, Le Maître de Musique, it's a beautiful um, uh, film with José Vanda, where he is uh, this great opera singer and also a teacher. He had two, only two students, a mm -hmm. soprano and a tenor, and it's a very beautiful, beautiful movie, and when I watched this movie, I had uh, it gave me also this romantic um, uh, feeling of oh yeah that's that's it you mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. I will find somebody who to teach me and to well, anyway so I came to to Germany at that time I was in relationship with a, a Brazilian soprano Laura de Souza uh, she passed away uh, unfortunately very very soon uh, last year um, anyway she was. Uh, very important uh, figure in, in person in my life mm. because she was uh, she was um, singing an ensemble of Castle mm -hmm. and we were we had she was from Porto Alegre too so we had the, the kind of uh, relationship uh, relationship 
And she said, yeah, come to Germany, live with me. And then from there, there on, we'll see. We'll find a teacher for you. So I, had, I was really very naive and very um, unprepared also. I was far away from being um, really prepared and really technical prepared. You know? mm. and, mm. and also as a, as a person, I was very, very naive, still very young, you know? mm. very e immature mm. in many. What actually was good because gave me this, you know, as being immature or naive, I was just, yeah, let's go, let's do it, you know. Yeah. I, I didn't have this, oh no, mm. it's going to be hard or difficult. Mm. Or mm. I just jumped. It, yes. it, it was yeah. very good. Yeah. But yeah, I, what would, I would on later on, uh, I would, um, or very soon enough, um, realize that uh, my dream, my romantic dream of finding a light mm -hmm. that would lead me was not so so easy. You know. Tell me a bit about the work uh, at the conservatory. Well, um, I was in Kassel. At that time, I still had the romantic idea of making private lessons and getting uh, to be a singer, <laughs> good singer, and just private lessons, you know, some years. <laughs> so I went to him and I auditioned for him. He said, yeah, um, I am a professor in Lübeck. Uh, I, you would apply for the Musikhochschule and you could come. And um, since I already had some fecha, you know, in, in Brazil, some theoretical things mm. I studied, it was I was able to translate them and they would be accepted as they really were in the Hochschule. But I was like, uh, oh, uh, University Hochschule. It was not my, what I was thinking, you know, mm. I was really like I thought I would find somebody who will help me and soon enough I'll be singing. You know. It was not like that. Anyway, so I said, okay, good. So I went to Lübeck. Mm. That was um, 1992 I began to study there. And I studied there till 97 officially. A lot of things happened in between. But uh, yeah. And then I was confronted with reality, more the reality of um, academic life, academic music, studying, and stuff like that. So I, I began to see what uh, this is about and what uh, the real world is about, you know. Because I was all the time watching those guys, uh, like the best of the best in the videos, and I thought, oh, what would be the, the best way to get there, you know, but I was not aware of how academic life was really, you know, in Europe and stuff like that. It took me a really, really a long time mm -hmm. to discover my voice, mm -hmm. really a long time. Mm -hmm. At that time, people would say I was a lirico leggero, mm -hmm. tenor, because I had a very easy top, mm -hmm. nothing under, Nothing in the middle of you know. Mm. Very, I had a very quick vibrato, very strange caprino mm. vibrato, and um, I realized that um, the way. I mean, I don't want to talk badly about uh, Professor Wagner who passed away, and but um, the way he was teaching was not suited for my voice. Let's say so. Okay, I don't know for other voices maybe. And soon enough, I realized that, and also the environment of the academic environment in Germany or in North Germany was for me, um, and also the life in North Germany was for me far from what I, uh, I needed. So I, I went to Italy, you know. I went to Italy to, um, to make a, a master class with Bergonzi. Ah. I'm talking now one year later already, mm -hmm. 93. Yeah. And in the Academia Kijana in Siena. So I applied for this master class. They didn't take me as a active singer, but as a listener, which was also very good because I was I didn't have the pressure of, you know, mm -hmm. I could just be there and observe, mm -hmm. abs ab absorb, mm -hmm. absorb. Um, the teachings and mm -hmm. I mean 
Bergonzi was a god, you know, one of the gods living at the time. And, um, and the life, also the Italian life, had m uh, much more to do with my uh, nature, although, you know, mm. although mm. I, am, uh, I come from South Brazil and um, from a German family. But I was raised in Brazil, and uh, you know, the culture is more similar to Italian mm. culture. If I may say so, I mean, to me it sounds like a, like a contradiction almost when you, say, when you talk about academic yeah. and then about singing opera. Yeah, to exactly. Me, these, these two things don't really mix well. I, yes, I, real, I realized that quite soon, that that was the reality of the Hochschule yes. and the reality outside, the theater reality, you know what I mean? Yeah, but that's terrible. It, so if, you, if you study something for many years yes. and then you realize that this is something you, if it's not something going to that you suit you, use. no, okay. uh, it, for very few people yeah. and for, for few people who already had something. I had some colleagues, for example, uh, uh, Klaus uh, Vogt, who was also in the Hochschule at the time with me. He just was beginning oh, really? to study. Oh, yeah. And very soon enough, he was in the career. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was even the contrary. I must say, this academic for, uh, formality, formalismus, mm -hmm. this corset, mm -hmm. um, took, almost took away the joy. I, because I came from Brazil with a lot of energy and joy and not so much technique and stuff. I was willing to learn that. Mm. But in the end, I didn't really learn it. And in the end, I didn't have also the joy to keep singing. But what, what are they doing wrong? Do you have any idea? I don't, I don't know. We, I can only raise questions about mm. that. Mm. What I know now, observing my path, is every person is a different instrument and needs its time to mature, to grow, to understand voice. It's very subtle, you know. It's not an instrument that you can learn mm. in five years, you're ready or not. Sometimes you're ready in two years, but sometimes it takes 20 years mm. or more, mm. you know. Mm. So, um, and of course, the. Uh, University had they have this time and they have to come through, you know, with the, uh, they have to teach and they, the singers or the students have to be uh, ready to to leave and to begin a, a professional life. Mm. So I think um, what happens lacks what, for me was lack of working the instrument instead of trying to teach to be musical. And to you know what I mean. Mm. So what I see today, when I saw at that time, was people were not ready as an instrument, mm. technically, mm. and they already been pushed to sing stuff that w requires a lot of. Um, uh, it requires the instrument to be ready. Yeah. So they were kind of trick tricking mm. into being musical, mm. but not really musical because mm. you cannot be real musical if your instrument is not ready to vibrate of course let's talk about a yeah. cello yes. you know you yeah. can trick something but if you don't have the if you don't um, you know if you don't have the instrument um, sounding how it's supposed to be you know, yeah technically yeah you cannot be uh, music, as musical as if you are inside you know yeah, yeah yeah of course so i think this is the this is the main problem you know and, 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 it's, it's a lack of time. Yeah. They don't have the time, maybe. And um, and also, to teach singing is a very, very fragile, fragile thing. Mm. You cannot expect that everybody would suit in, into a technique. Oh, this is the technique. You have to, you know, to learn this. As a teacher, I think you have to be open and able to understand the, the problems, the differences, what this instrument needs, mm. and this one is different. You cannot say, okay, no, no, singing is like this, and you have to be put into this box. And it's a path of also inner discovery. That was for me very clear from the beginning. It's not only learning how to sing, it's learning how to be a person. 
know, to be, because singing is, is uh, your instrument is something you cannot touch. You, you, you live from sensations mm. and thoughts generate sensations mm. and thoughts generate emotions mm. and sensations. So everything is inside, mm. you know. Mm. Mm. So that's why it's a very, uh, it's, it's, it's a wonderful universe. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, and it and for me singing it's it's really it's a path of self discovery mm. more than anything else. Uh, a question here from yes, uh, Isaac Thomas. Okay. Who um, who wants to know? I'm curious about your habits in your early twenties. When did you feel your technique? When did you think that you understood your voice? When did you actually, and when did his voice teachers and mentors understood his voice? Oh, yeah. <laughs> In the your 20s, voice. it was far away from that. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Not so easy to answer, but um, my mentors, my teachers, I mean, they are also only human beings, you know. Mm -hmm. As a teacher, it's, that's, that, that that's why it's not so easy to teach, mm. to really to teach, because um, you are dealing with um, with emotions, with sensations, uh, so somebody else's sensations. So my mentors, my teachers were trying to give what they know, what they can do, you know. Mm. And um, so at that time, I was hearing a lot about maske and projection, mm. and oh, you're a tenor, you have to sing very high and it, everything is out there, mm -hmm. it's high, mm -hmm. and you know what I mean? Oh, it's, everything is high. And this alone is the killer <laughs> <laughs> for everybody, not only for tenors. Yeah. But you know what I mean? Yeah. Because they, took, they take the r result as a cause. Yes, exactly. They, this result yeah. of singing high, they think, oh, you have to think high, or you have to go there in order to sing and actually, I learned really later, much later, that it's completely the contrary. You have to go down to go high. But this is another thing. So at that time, when I was 20, to answer the question, I was completely lost and getting loster and loster. And more, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So and, and again, to this question, in the, my early 20s, I was uh, more and more lost. I was not gaining anything. To my, or I thought I was not gaining, but in the end, that was my path, so to say. I cannot say um, it was important to make this, to, to, to go to, through this path. It's a, it was a long path and not a linear path, you know. So at that time, I was really lost. Did you want to quit? Yes. Uh, oh, yeah. I, and I quit. Um, uh, or exactly how do you call it? Actually, actually, I quit it. In the beginning of my career, so to say, I was still a, um, a student in Lübeck, and uh, I don't know how I, I got. I was, I was like, okay, I have to learn by doing. So I began to make uh, auditions everywhere, I make a lot of auditions, and I got a, um, a I, I got a chance to to be part of the ensemble of. Uh, Stadttheater Bremerhaven. That was in '96. So I went to audition in the summer before, and they took me. And I was like, "Oh, wow! Oh, this is great!" You know. Although uh, I was, um, and I was already 27. Yes, '96. Although inside I was like not sure I was ready for that, but I wanted so badly. And later on, I talked to my professor in Lübeck. I, I asked him later on, why did you allow me to go there? And he said, ah, you want it so badly, and maybe it would be good for you, blah, blah, blah. Because now, OK, we can, if I look back, OK, this is also part of my learning process of my life. But it was terrible, actually, because I was far from being ready 
to face the lyrical rep repertoire. And I was there as a lyrical tenor, you know, singing my first role would be Nemorino, mm. which is a very difficult role, Donizetti, and I got ill. So my body was really fighting against it because I was not ready and I was, I knew it because it was so difficult. Mm. Why? Because I knew how it was supposed to, to, to sing. I knew how this music was supposed to sound. Yeah. And I was not delivering it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was not only, okay, let's do it, I don't care. Yeah. More or yeah. less. I knew it was not, I, the thing, the way to sing this was far away from my reality at that moment. So I was really kind of lost. Also psychological, I was beginning to be kind of depressive, you know, living in Germany and the weather and the culture. You know, you have to think, I came to Germany without speaking German. You know, mm. I just, as I said, I jumped into this uh, thing and I wanted to sing and then I was faced with the reality and I had to then to run after that. The thing is, although I was very lost and although I was um, completely unsatisfied with my singing, I didn't quit the, the dream of singing. I quit singing because after two years in Bremerhaven, with the worst critics you can imagine, I had a really, but the guy was right, the, the critic, he, he, he hate, hated my guts. <laughs> and I thought, okay, there, something is wrong here. I cannot be, this cannot be what I aim. You know, that must be something else, or I'm not done for this profession. Maybe it's not my thing. There is another question from um, Ulrike SSK. What do you recommend when someone wants to give up due to the lack of success? So you get again? Due to the lack of success. Oh, okay. This is very important. So first of all, you have to answer for yourself what success means. Because mm. if you are aiming for a success from applause from the public, you should quit and do something else, you know, because if you're going to serve an art form only thinking about success, you are in the wrong métier, you're doing the wrong thing. Mm. Doesn't matter what, if you're aiming for applause or aiming to be successful, because what success means, it's what I, I said, I think, mm. is to, to be the best you can be for yourself, you know, and the other success will be a consequence or depending on luck or your stars or agency or how you look or la la la. Or things that somebody sometimes are um, independent from yourself. Success, you know what I mean? So giving up was for me very important because I gave up. But what did I get? I didn't give up my dream of singing. I gave up the path I was into, which was exactly, I have to sing and to be successful and to, you know, I was against, going against a wall and I thought uh, I had kind of illumination. After Bremerhaven, I said, because I was really unsatisfied with my singing, I, I was listening and I said, this is bad, this is not good. So I stopped. I went back to Hamburg. I was living in Hamburg at the time in, in, in a VG with a, a Brazilian friend, which was a beautiful time. Mm. I stepped out of this dream a little bit, and I was living then from, uh, you know, uh, Arbeitslosengeld uh, from, because I was working two years, so I was just surviving modus, trying to find myself again, because I was fighting so hard so hard, uh, you know, I was like, I had this ambition, but I realized, oh, maybe I should stop a little bit. And this position of giving up, not abandoning the dream, but giving up that path of struggle. Yeah, ambition. And it was a hard thing. Yeah. It was a struggle, only struggle, and I was mentally, I was, emotionally um, very vulnerable and very
very uh, um, depressive, really depressive, really. So teaching, I was, uh, you know, the right things and put with these papers that people like, oh, is that something right? <laughs> Telephone number, you know, like <laughs> And I had some three, four, five um, people from different ages, different backgrounds, wanting to sing a little bit, mm. not. Mm. So mm. I don't remember how much I was charging, but something I could, you know, could help me to, to live. When I began to teach these people, which I have to repeat, it was not uh, really uh, the technique of opera singing. It was more about discovering the bodies, making some uh, exercise for, for brief breathing exercises and then using the voice. I began to teach myself. So I went out of this position of a student, like giving up everything and trying to receive from somebody. I was then giving them but giving myself I was the teacher for myself so when I was giving them examples suddenly my voice was f in a very good uh, position and shape I was like wow this was uh, very interesting and this was a key moment for me so I was teaching them and oh you have to you're supposed to sing like this and make a vocalize you know I would do an as an example and I thought oh this is good that means that you basically are self-taught. Yes, um, I can say that. Yes, um, and you had, of course, your um, well, your idols of the past. That sure. You to. Yes, and that leads me to the next question by by Diva Renata, who who wants to know which tenors of past generation have inspired you. Oh, a lot of them, a lot of them. I must say, when I began to sing that I thought I was a Lirico Ligero, and I was watching these amazing videos from the Metropolitan. Um, I used to listen to Nicolai Guetta a lot, mm -hmm. also to Fredo Krauts, to Placido Domingo, and Pavarotti not so much at the time. So it was Juicy Berlin. Mm -hmm. So lighter tenors, but those amazing guys. And later on, when I could find um, a relation to my my real voice, then I began to listen more to Bergonzi, Caruso, anyways, anyway. Mm. Bergonzi, Del Monaco, Corelli, and then I thought, okay, this is what I need. This is my, what I need for my instrument, is this kind of singing. If you compare Geta, Kraus, Domingo, Pavarotti, Corelli, Bjork, Caruso, Bergonzi, all amazing singers singing with their own instrument, their own way of singing, which differs between them a lot, yeah. but worked for each one of them, you know what I mean? And everyone would say, oh no, I sing that this is my, that's the right way to sing, you know, because I, I was there, I was having lessons to Bergonzi, with Bergonzi, I was having lessons with Kraus, and they would say completely different things and say, this is the right thing. Kraus would say, there is no passaggio, spinge nel naso. It worked for him and for a few pe uh, people, maybe. And Bergonzi would say, sul fiato morbido rotondo, mm -hmm. which it's also very important for somebody, but it doesn't give you anything if you are a 23 year years old student, you know, you know, but it's, images that you can work with later on yeah so yeah. all those guys are inspiration you know mm -hmm. are an inspiration for me the the key moment of understanding or trying to understand what Corelli was doing because those guys were very concerned about sound mm -hmm. production so that's why that's why I related a lot to to uh, Corelli, to, to Del Monaco, to mm. Caruso, you know. Because mm. yeah. I found out, oh yes, larynx must go down. Nobody told me that in 20 years of, this is crazy, of studying academically. Nobody ever said larynx must go down so you have space. 
nobody. I had to, to learn, uh, you know, by trying to imitate, of to, to, uh, you know, watching and yeah. um, uh, listening to the skies. Do you consider yourself an artist? That's a very good question. It's very easy nowadays to say, oh, I'm an artist because I'm an opera singer and I do art. I don't like this word very much, you know, artist, because it's mis misused a lot. What is an artist? I think I am an artist when I'm able on the stage for the public to serve emotionally, technically, musically, what Verdi, what Puccini, Giordano wrote, serving and giving my emotions to that. And I will be an artist when the, all these things come together, resulting in something that people would say, wow, it touched me, that touched me, it's beautiful, it's truth, it's a truth. You know? Then in this moment, I can say I'm an artist because I'm a tool, I'm an instrument. Mm. I am, I'm nothing alone, you know, I'm a tool. So that's why it's so important to work on your technique and your maturity as, 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 a, as a human being to be a tool for these geniuses. Because we're talking about geniuses, Wagner, Mozart, Puccini, Verdi, they're geniuses, they work this amazing things that need to be served by people, by instruments, by tools who are ready, open, mature, intelligent or um, uh, sensitive, willing to be this channel. We are channels as interpreters, channels. Are you able to do it in today's opera scene? Ah, <laughs> yeah, that's also a good question. What is an artist? So, as I said, sometimes I feel I am an artist. Most of the time, I'm not allowed to be an artist when in some productions. Sometimes I step in a production where the metteur en scène, the regisseur, has already of course, he has his idea uh, of this production, how he wants to, all good. But sometimes I step in productions where everything is ready and nobody is interested in what I have to say, what I have to give, what I sound, how I sound, how I move. I am just placed in, in uh, you know, in, in places on the stage, geographically, you come from there, you go there, you see. And then it's impossible to be an artist because if you are not able to be the instrument, the tool, the channel, so you are just a marionette that maybe sings good, but also that's not so important nowadays anymore. Not really, it's some, it's, uh, you know, uh, I see sometimes things or hear things that make me feel a little bit sad about this profession because it's not anymore about singing and opera is singing because you can have a wonderful I'm sorry maybe people will hate me for that but sometimes you can have a fantastic opera night concertante or semi insinuate if you trust the artist, the singers, that they move, that they interpret this part. People will get it. You don't have to make crazy things, you know, visual things. You can add, of course, it's beautiful if you have, you can add some, something visual to the already great singers and voices. But first, opera is voice. You cannot replace a good voice with a good looking person. It's impossible. Then let me, um, let me ask, I mean, the trend towards 
the, 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 the visual staging is very clear. Yeah, of course. Um, We're not going back. Uh, and we are not going back. No. So is opera condemned to die? No, I don't think so. So how do we save it? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to give answers. I want mm. to raise questions because that's, uh, you know, I'm not, I don't know, really. <sighs> and it's, uh, it's, um, it's a passion, you know, it's something you learn and you have to learn it technically, you have to learn musically and stuff, but it's a passion. It's art is, is heart, it comes from the heart and should touch the heart. This is art. Everything else, other stimuli and visual things can, can add things, but can also be disturbing, right? So the trend on making opera more and more visual uh, impactant for the public seems to me very naive, actually, and wrong, because you will, we, theater will never be able to compete with television, with cinema. Because in the theater, the public is sitting here and th something is happening on the stage. And you have this, you know. And in the television and cinema, you can see faces like this. And so you do like small movements and it says a lot. But theater, you transpose, you, you trans uh, transpose the feelings, the emotions in a bigger way. It's, everything is bigger. And, um, and trying to compete with, um, with, with cinema or with television, I think it's, it's misplaced, it's, it's wrong. Adding it is, is okay, but you cannot forget the instrument. The first thing it's singing is the voice, it's the production of the sound of music. So this is very, uh, yeah. And so nowadays there are some directors who, who can put it together, which is great. You can have amazing modern productions, amazing, beautiful, who tells stories, where the singers can be artists and tell a story, because we are here, we are telling stories. Mm. But if you have a, a director who completely take the story out of context and twist completely the, sto the plot, using and abusing the librettist and the composer, for me this is wrong, because he's abusing something that is great to put his vision. So he's comparing himself to Verdi and to Puccini. He must think, he must have a really great image of himself, thinking he's a genius, that he has something to say as important as Boito. Verdi, Puccini, you know what I mean? Mm. And maybe there are some geniuses. I didn't, I didn't, I don't know, meet them yet. You know what I mean? But if you are using an art form that already exists to put your thing, it's like if I would take a Mona Lisa and, no, no, I think it should, you know, no, this is better because it's more modern. And she's actually, uh, sitting on the WC in a Bahnhof. Why not? You know? Wow, yeah, fantastic. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> we're not serving egos here. We're not serving our own egos. We're not serving the, a conductor egos. We're not serving a director ego. Because even though, even if they can be artists, there are some artists who are very egocentric. But if they are doing the, their thing and being and serving the real geniuses, and then it's okay. This is kind of funny, I would say, because this, this man here, he knows the opera house from the back end, but not from the yes, front end. No. So it's how strange. often have you been inside this room? Well, as a public once, <laughs> yeah, as once. public, <laughs> and uh, all, also sometimes uh, watching the, some rehearsal or something, but uh, yes. not very often. Uh, not very often. Not very often. No, 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 no. And? It's beautiful. Um, it's amazing. It's, it's, it's a very, very nice uh, yeah. opera house, I think. It is. And the acoustics are nice. 
Yeah. I think it is nice to see here. It's a very good, yeah, very good acoustics. Yeah. But um, speaking of not very often, uh, I wanted to speak about Manon Lescaut. Yes. And that's an opera that isn't played very often. Mm. Yes. Um, what's the reason for that, do you think? And it's very demanding. It's uh, the main roles, um, Manon and De Brie, mm. are very, very, very demanding roles. Mm. They're very long, emotionally very demanding, mm. and technically, of course. So to find singers who can sing through the night without risking their instruments, uh, maybe it's not so easy, because it's, um, yeah, it's, it's very, they are very dramatic roles. They're very mm -hmm. The four acts are very different. They're Correct. very different. For the tenor, I don't know, it begins quite lyrical, in a very high tessitura, very high tessitura, always uh, above, over, over the passaggio, uh -huh. above the passaggio. And um, the, the, the Puccini mm, writing is already there. The, the, the way he, he, he leads the, the, the words and the phrases are very um, organic to sing. It's very good to sing Puccini always, you know. Mm. But it's not so easy as, let's say, easy. It's not uh, so easy as Tosca, for example, or, or Buen. So the first act, as, as I said, begins quite lyrical. And already in the second act, um, with the duet, um, De Grie is showing quite aggressive emotions, of course, because of the story. Mm. And it goes into the very dramatic third act, mm. very dramatic fourth act. Mm. Um, for both of them. So it is a very long opera for the singer because we're constantly giving 100%, you know. Mm. There mm. are no parts, they are just easy, you know. Mm. They're always mm. very, very meaty, mm. juicy, mm. which is an uh, enormous challenge. Yes. It's, it's very rewarding. Yes. yes, yes, to master it. Yes, but of course. When you think about um, single moments of the opera which are, which create the most difficulty. You know, one of my uh, suspects would be No 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 Vivi Mai, which I mm. always imagined is a terrible aria to sing because it sits so high, a little bit above the passaggio or in the passaggio, yeah. and then you have the B flats that, that return. Yeah. yeah, but it's still, uh, mm. it's, for me, it's, uh, I wouldn't say it's easy, nothing is easy in opera, mm. but it's very organic. It's not mm. an aria that you say, oh my god, mm. although it is in the beginning and it is very high, mm. but the way it's written, you have time to release the pressure, the, you have the, uh, release the tensions mm. between the phrases mm. and prepare for the high notes, mm. you know, mm. and they are not all the time of this, yes. go down, yes. and he uses the words very wisely, so when you, when you lay into the motion of the words yes. by Puccini, he carries, he carries you. Really? You know, you have to trust the words also, the meaning of the words, mm. you know? Yeah. So it's very, very genius, the way he, he, he used the words together with the music, mm. you know? Mm. Mm. It's not, it's, it's almost, it's get easier, you know? Puccini has this magic, you know? It's like, uh, I was talking with a friend, uh, like Cine Puccini is like, Puccini takes you to, to Disneyland, kind of stuff. He takes by your hand to have a, a ride, you know what I mean? To have a magic thing, because of course, if you begin to think technically about phrases, you get stuck into, oh my God, this is high, this is a G, this is passaggio, you know? But you, you cannot sing like that, you cannot think like that. Uh, the, the, the earlier I forget that I'm uh, uh, thinking technically, the better it is. Yeah. Because this work we did, we do before that. The technical yeah. work we do when you learn the role, when you rehearse the role, then you put in the voice, then you try different things, then uh, 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 uh. So when you are ready to present, mm. when you're ready to sing, you have to uh, be able to uh, dive into the emotions. Now, Manon Lescaut is a very, very emotional opera. It is. Is it good in this case to let go and let just dive into the emotions, or is it better 
to keep your emotional distance. When I say dive to the emotions, I don't say lose yourself into the emotions. Mm -hmm. There's a difference. Mm -hmm. You can very easily in this rap or in the Verismo rap like Pagliacci to get cared by the pathos. Mm -hmm. And this can be very dangerous. Mm. For the voice. Oh yeah. You can get easily uh, you know, trascinato mm. uh, by this pathos. You have always, as a singer, to have a little bit of distance, you know, because the public have to feel the pathos, have to feel the, the emotions that you are, of course, you are feeling it, but you are not feeling the same way they are feeling. Mm. Because mm. we have to uh, still be uh, the uh, leaders and the, the, the hair, you have to be the. the Master. The master of your art. You cannot let it just go. But when I say dive, you dive into the emotion of the role without losing yourself for the role. Mm. You have to have the both things. You know what I mean? It happens like almost parallel. You kind of observe yourself mm. doing it. In the, in, you know. What do you think? Um, about uh, like the, the histrionics of, of Gigli, let's say, when he goes... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, at the end of si, the third capitano, act. Grazie, yeah, grazie. Well, and then an additional, bam, I yeah, 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 for, yeah. for pleasing the crowd. Would you ever do something like no, that? No, no. No? Um, I don't think so. Mm. I don't think so. I don't know. I, <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would love to be there in the moment, to, maybe to understand that, because yeah. maybe sometimes uh, an artist feels like totally immerse in the role that he allows himself also in the end of Pagliacci or the aria of Vesta yeah, Juba yeah. and um, when when it's when you feel the, the artist is being um, um, how, how, how I can say he's being true with his emotions it's mm. okay mm. It can be okay mm. Mm. by by this rap yes. and better in the later uh, there is more. Yeah. It's, it's possible, but if you are just repeating because Gili did or the Monaco or stuff, you just then you know, as a public, I would say this is fake. Yeah, he's just trying to get more applause. You know? So I cannot judge Gili because I was not there. Mm -hmm. And if he did, his emotions were sincere and truth, uh, why not? Mm. It can happen. Sometimes in, in Carmen and Don Jose, I allowed myself also some things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I feel if, if that belongs to the role at this moment, mm. and also I can be judged by the public, then later maybe it was over the top, maybe not. I tend to be more dry in this thing, mm. to be more into the music. Mm. Uh, also by Tosca, uh, Lucia Van um, in the end, and stuff like that, not to because the music is so rich, you know, and Puccini is so rich on emotions mm. that alone the fact that you are able to surf these uh, waves of emotions is a lot. Um, tell us something about the, the production. Well, it is a very beautiful production mm. from, I think, 2004, mm. and uh, with um, traditional costumes. Um, it's a little bit kind of modern, but uh, in, the, in the time, it is it's in the time production, it's a kind of traditional production, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. from the sets and the time. It's yeah. not a completely traditional production, because it has some uh, abstract um, things mm -hmm. in it, in the sets, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, it's going to be understood. Nice. This is very important. <laughs> yeah. so will, uh, watch it, we'll hear it, and we'll understand the story, which is nowadays it's about. Yeah. yeah. And when can uh, when can the people hear you? Uh, the 11th is the going to be the, uh, the premiere, the video of the 11th, 14th, and the 20th mm -hmm. of May. Okay. Deutsche Oper, Berlin. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> yes, I'm so happy. What are you going to do the rest of the year? Wow, there's a, uh, this, I, I this is a Puccini year, Puccini. you know? Yeah. This is actually a Turandot year. Yes. Crazy yes. that happened so many Turandots. I come from singing a Turandot in Amsterdam. Yes. And then, um, and then I have this Puccini 
with Manuel Lesko. Then I, I'm, I'm still singing in Carmen in Stuttgart now. And then I will fly to Madrid for a Turandot. Beautiful. Teatro Real, it will be my debut. debut. Nice. I'm very happy about that. Mm -hmm. And then, um, then this is with June, July. Then in September, I'll come back to the Deutsche Oper for more Puccini, but Tosca and Turandot nice. here in the Dutch yes. Oper. And in the end of the year, I'll be in Barcelona singing another Turandot. So it's this big Calaf and Puccini year, yes. and I cannot be more happy. Uh, I mean, it's really um, a bliss, a bliss, you know. Sounds yeah. perfect. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, well, that's not strictly technical, but about your routine on the day of performance, oh, from morning okay. to evening. Oh, uh, there is no morning? There is no morning. No, no, no. no. I sleep. I, I'll try to sleep as much as I can, yeah. if the performance is at night, of course, or in the evening. Um, the routine would be would begin already the day before, and in, in um, um, ideal um, world would be like I have a free day before uh, for a, a show, mm -hmm. right? So already the day before, I'm like resting, and I try to not to eat very heavily in the evening, so I can have a good sleep, sleep as much as I can, like I can sleep 10, 11, 12 hours sometimes, which is great. So this is for me uh, very important to feel rested, the instrument is rested, and my mind is, you know, after, I did all the work, preparation work, technical work, so it's time to just be ready and be relaxed. Do you drink or smoke? Sometimes, yeah, sometimes I drink. I like to drink some wine, sometimes some beer, sometimes some whiskey, always depending on the occasion. Sometimes I smoke a cigarette. I'm not a smoker, you know, you wouldn't see me buying cigarettes. But sometimes I like ask for a cigarette. And yeah, if I know I have time after a show, some, uh, you know, or if I don't have to sing the next days, I allow myself to to have a normal life. You know. How about um, singing in languages you don't speak? Oh, this is going to come very soon. Also here in the Deutsche Oper, I will next year uh, debut uh, Big Down by mm. Tchaikovsky. This is a very, um, yeah, um, a very difficult thing. Um, to try to, to transport the emotions through a, a language that is not yours, that you don't know how to, talk, to speak. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, the music of Tchaikovsky is amazing, and it's already a lot of, a lot there, mm -hmm. uh, alone in the in music. But, um, so, um, but you have to learn, um, I mean, I cannot learn to speak Russian, but I'm, I'm learning um, really how to uh, yeah how to, s to speak what I'm singing mm -hmm. and of course what I'm saying and why I'm saying. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. But it was it's, it's never going to be like uh, singing in a language that I can I can talk like Italian or German. You know? yeah. But it's, it's so it's it's a it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very demanding work. Isaac Toms would like to know how much work does he put into a piece of music, opera, or warm-ups? How much work I put in a piece of music? When, when you will learn a piece of music or an opera, ah. how much time does it take? How much oh. time do you, do you use? Well, uh, since I have been now luckily more or less singing more or less the same repertoire in the last five years or something. A uh, repertoire that I already know from hearing or from singing. Um, um, the amount of time is getting less and less, more or less, you know. But if I'm learning a new role or a role that I never heard before, mm -hmm. it takes, of course, like a big down, yeah. a lot of time, like a year, a year. of preparation. Yes, a year of preparation. Oh, yes. Even more, because actually, I was supposed to sing a big down here, and it was cancelled because COVID. Mm. You know. mm. So I was already into this. Um, but for example, when I uh, when I debut uh, Cavaradossi mm. last year, mm. I never sang it, but I had in my in my 
here. Yeah. You know, I sang the aria, I, I sang a reconnaissance, both arias, mm -hmm. the reconnaissance harmonia and the Chevalier and Stelle. And I had a little bit, of course, this music in my ear, so it was not something completely. Uh, so yeah. it was actually very, it went, it came to me very quick. Actually. So it actually Some depends. Months. It depends on what it is. Depends what it is, and yeah. if you're fa fami familiar, as I, familiar, as, uh, familiar, if you're yeah. familiar with the rap, yes. you know what I mean? So it's Puccini, it's the way it's written, it's not something like Lulu or, you know. <laughs> yes. you know. yeah. Random tenor dude wants to know, oh, okay. can he describe his technique and what methods he used to develop it? What are the best tips for breath, breath training? How does he warm up? So three things. Mm -hmm. Can you describe your technique? Yeah, well, now, um, I think uh, in the last past two or three years, I began to be able to describe it and mm -hmm. say, uh, because as I said, I, I work very instinctly, instinctively, you know, mm -hmm. in, in singing. And now I'm beginning to understand also with my mind mm -hmm. what I'm supposed to do, what, uh, because it's also important for me to know, of course. Um, I would say, for me, the, um, the larynx and uh, the larynx must come down, of course, and the breath is the most important thing because you have the appoggio, what do you call it in, the, uh, in English, uh, support, support, which actually is not the same mm -hmm. because when you, you, you lean something mm -hmm. on the table, you are appoggio. You're leaning something. This is what you do with your voice. You lean your voice over the breath, mm. over this column of breath. Okay. So when I begin to warm up or to think, to 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 to, to work on on a piece or warm up or whatever, um, I have the feeling I the voice is coming down. You know. Some people call it inalare la voce, maybe. I'm not quite sure. Because can also give the feeling of, which is not completely wrong, but um, the feeling for me is going down into the body and make the body resonate as an instrument. And the result will be what they call the resonances, the high resonances, the chest resonance, and everything else, masque, whatever. It's consequence. You cannot think on working on the consequence. We have to think also, we have to think on the causes of, of this resonance, mm -hmm. right? So making the instrument vibrate completely. I always think about a cello. Mm -hmm. Make it in, in all the tessitura, how it, how it's going to, uh, how it's going to vibrate fully all mm -hmm. the time. So you have the spectrum of possibilities. And then you can use this for the phrases, for the style, what you're going to say, you know. But first you have to, to work on this uh, waking up all these vibrations, you know. Yeah. So and then everything else goes into place, all the causes yes, and that follows. Yes, yeah. yes. And I also think a lot about the words, you know, mm -hmm. the declamare, mm -hmm. the yeah. words, you know, yeah. because that helps because those composers wrote for the words, yes. you know, in my rap. So they are thought, the words were thought. It's mm -hmm. not only sounds you're doing. Mm -hmm. So the words, how do you speak it and what they mean, mm -hmm. gives you also the tools, you know, mm -hmm. technical tools mm -hmm. for the musical result, yeah. you know. Mm, breathing? Breathing. I, for me, um, I have to, to get read of all possible or the most possible technical things because when I was studying the people say okay you have to breathe you have to open this and it's going to down and blah 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 and then palato and then you have to sing and I was like what how can I s you know what I mean mm -hmm. all these uh, steps and yeah. then sing yeah this this for, for me too much mm -hmm. of course you have to know that this happens yeah but um, Sometimes you have to trust that 
is going to happen because your instrument is going to take what it needs on air, on space. So if you prepare the space, if you prepare too much, if you have too much air, it's not going to be, uh, uh, it's not going to be organic singing. It's going to be something artificial. Mm -hmm. And singing is based on speak. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, singing comes from si canta come si parla. Mm -hmm. Of course, we don't sing like we talk, but we run like we walk, mm -hmm. right? The first thing is to walk, mm -hmm. is to talk. Mm -hmm. Running, which would be singing, it's the same legs, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So it comes from the same body. So it's nothing uh, from outside that you put, oh, now I can sing. No, you use your larynx, you lose your lungs, you lose your vocal cords, everything is there. Mm. And the resonance will happen properly if you do the proper uh, steps, of mm. course. Mm. But once you begin to sing, for me, I, when I begin to sing, I, I have to completely forget this. Mm. Not think yeah. technically. Yeah. Not yeah. think, oh, I have to, pre no, no. Mm. For me, it doesn't help. Uh, on the contrary, it's, it's, it's worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. It disturbs. It disturbs. Um, yeah. What about warming up? Do you warm up? Oh yeah, I warm up a lot. Mm -hmm. And not because my voice needs, but because my mind needs. Actually, my voice, when I'm in vacation, and I am like bringing capirinhas and the sun and sleeping three hours, mm -hmm. My voice is perfect mm -hmm. because my mind is just yeah. relaxed. Mm -hmm. But when I, you know, when you are singing, we're like, oh my God, I have to sing. So um, I warm up because I need my body to trust, okay, in getting warm. Of course, the muscles mm -hmm. should be warm because uh, mm -hmm. warm up. It's it's like sports. You have mm -hmm. to be prepared because to sing an opera, it's uh, like running. Uh, sometimes like r running a marathon or running a hundred meters or something. So you have to be warm up with muscles. Mm -hmm. But sometimes the voice is already there. Or well, actually it is, I mean, the voice is here. Uh, you know, what can go wrong? Yeah. But the process of putting all together, uh, you can have it by warming up properly. Just feeling the, the breath, getting calm. You know, for me it's very important to get the calm thoughts and feel this wave of breath. So I can be ready for the phrase when I need. Yeah, it's just it's warming up the mind as well. Yes. Yeah. But are there some um, specific exercises that you do that you always do? Um, I do some humming. Mm -hmm. Some humming. Mm -hmm. I like to sing under the hot shower, which is a cliche, but it's very good because it helps. You know the. Uh, Moisturize and, mm -hmm. um, and also the acoustics normally in the toilet is very good. <laughs> um, hum, humming, mm -hmm. you know, and um, some scales, but I don't do too many scales. Mm -hmm. I, I, I work up the middle range, mm -hmm. lower middle range, mm -hmm. so that I feel that they are really connected to the body, mm -hmm. and I don't sing too much high notes. Um, and then um, I use some phrases of operas yeah. or songs yeah. Yeah. or caro mio ben mm. or uh, canzone or something like this just to get over the breath and, mm. you know, and to feel the flow. When you do scales, um, do you do, on which vowels do you do them? Um, yeah, all vowels. All. I, uh, I, uh, I use a lot of E, mm -hmm. E vowel and A. Mm -hmm. But I use actually all. Yeah, uh, so different. Sometimes it depends on the day. Mm -hmm. You will feel sometimes, oh, um, I have a very, I feel my voice very uh, metallic mm -hmm. today, mm -hmm. so I have to work in something more round, something a more close vowel or a U or a O. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Or the contrary, I have to use more E to feel this resonance a little bit um, lighter or, or more metal on mm -hmm. it, you know, it depends on the, on the day. How important is falsetto? Hmm. Falsetto. It's it's very good to I use falsetto to to check 
be the voice is um, is rested. Mm -hmm. I use a little bit in the warm up, a little bit to feel that the voice is because if you have a falsetto, it's a sign that your voice is um, um, is in good shape. Mm -hmm. If you don't have falsetto, they are not really um, closing properly, you know. Mm -hmm. But I don't use falsetto, and I don't think falsetto is something um, in my rap that you use uh, singing, you know, really falsetto. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. uh, what would be uh, your advice for young singers? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do we <you> have time? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, yeah. One advice is, um, yeah, to trust your guts and not, don't try to serve the, don't get lost into the su success thing, you know what I mean? Try to serve the art form that you are trying to learn. So be in love with what you do and try to, to take the best you have, to give the best you have. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's, a, it's a journey, it's an inside journey. It's not only learning a métier, but it's learning how you can, as we talked before, serve it the best. Mm -hmm. So my advice is really to dive into it and to listen to all singers of the past and the present. Mm -hmm. To experiment with your instrument. To scream until you get uh, no, you know what I mean. Try your boundaries. Try uh, to sing wrong. Try to sing ugly. Try different things, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because the human voice is so rich, and the human soul, which is connected to the voice, is so rich. So you're going to um, even develop your soul, your being, your discovering things that you maybe you didn't know about yourself. Mm -hmm. So the voice is a tool of self encounter. Mm -hmm. So uh, dive, dive into into, into uh, voice and be in love with what you, what you do. Mm -hmm. yeah. And not don't take what people say um, or people much sometimes very with very good intentions trying to teach you or to give you but always question and always, because in singing there is no, not one, uh, how we can say, one unique uh, truth. There will be different truths for you that maybe you can use and the other one cannot use or, you know. So be open for different um, uh, sources and ways. And beware of teachers who say that only they know the truth. Exactly, exactly. Be aware of teachers. Yes, exactly. Because, yeah, I know. Because when I go to a teacher, mm -hmm. I still go to some uh, people. To, when you go to a teacher, you normally you give up what you know mm -hmm. because you want to receive something. Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, it's bad that you forget it, you know, because you and this teacher is going to bring you to a completely different path that, that is yours or mm. it's not going to be truth to your nature mm. Mm. sometimes but sometimes not so it's it's very important it's a process of learning is very difficult because it's difficult to when you're learning with somebody it's difficult to make it um, to make what it is ex expect from you at, at this at the same time mm. to put into into Singing, yeah, you, yeah. It's, sometimes it's a process that takes weeks, months. Mm. You know, it's mm. not so easy because you have to understand emotionally, physically, what you have been told to do. You know, mm. and sometimes it takes time until you, you realize it's completely wrong. Mm. That's that's a problem also. So you have to be patient to try to make what is expected from you because it needs some time. And maybe, and being aware that maybe it's not your path, because there's no insurance that this is the right thing. But you have to try. Mm. So you're going to lose some time and some money, maybe. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, it's, it's something you cannot hear yourself. You cannot see what you're doing. Yes. It is cost it time is process. and money. It and you have time. to trust someone exactly. who someone. you don't know. Exactly. Going, exactly. Going to exactly. It is like this. And then maybe yeah. what he teaches, teaches you today is not going to serve you now, but it's going to serve you in 10 years also. Because everything is inf information that maybe can be used, mm. but maybe not in this time. So this, this is why it's so fragile, so difficult, the art of teaching mm. properly. Mm. Because not only showing, oh, do like this. No, I have to understand your instrument. Mm. Mm. I have yeah. to understand your instrument to teach you. Mm. you know, and be able and be open to, you know, to work with that mm. in a new way, in a, a, a fresh way. Mm. So what do you do, Master Classes? I, I did some uh, here in Berlin uh, in, the, in the time of COVID. I worked with tenors, only tenors. Uh -huh. <laughs> and because I, I want to teach, but I am aware of the difficulty of teaching properly. It needs time. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's very passionate. And when I teach, I sing also. And it, so it demands a lot of energy. I cannot teach and be singing at the same time. You know, it takes me too much energy. And I don't want to just give tricks, make tricks, you know, just give a master class and say, yeah, think on the cloud, and you know what I mean, and uh, give me the money. It's, it's too easy, and it's not right, you know. So I, I want to teach, and I'm beginning more or less to develop um, what I, I need to find a, um, um, I need to find a way of giving it back mm. you know, in a way that is understood. So I have to understand myself first. First what I do, put it into words, so theorize it, so I can give it. Mm. So it is also for me a process now. Mm. So I will begin to teach more and more. Yes. But I listen to singers always when I can, I give advice. But really teaching, it's, uh, yeah, it's something that uh, will take some time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for the questions. Thank you. Basta. <laughs>
the way I found for myself to sing is um, is is um, um, attached to so much um, I don't know so much emotion or something that is difficult for me to to do it in a light way. You know, what yeah. I mean? It's really difficult to me. It's very crazy, mm. yeah. so and I, I get very yeah. nervous when I have to sing for, for example, I sang for my mother's birthday or my uh, anivers anniversary of marriage of my parents. I was so nervous, much more nervous than singing, debutating here in the Deutsche Oper or debutating on Tello. Really, this makes me real nervous. Yeah. When it's people who when it's people who, you know who I know and love yeah. me and are not yeah. judging me. You know, and it makes me real nervous. I don't know why. It's, it's crazy. I know it's crazy, but <laughs> <laughs> I have to have this, uh, maybe this distance. I don't know. Mm. You know? Mm. Yeah, yeah. So it's not nothing against you. Please. No, no, no. But for me. I will try again. Yes, you try next time. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs>